Hello everyone. My name is Adrian Markish and I'm the publisher and editor of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled, What is an Enterprise Business Rule Repository? Do, do I need one? Today's moderator is Rich Southwell, Business Development Manager with New Wisdom Software. Rich will be presenting alongside Daniel Shaput, Director of Professional Services, and Lee Lambert, Managing Partner of New Wisdom Software. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including a Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. I would also like to say thank you to New Wisdom Software for sponsoring this event. At this time, I will turn over to Rich to get us started. Thank you, Adrian, and good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Rich Southwell, and I want to thank you all for joining our Modern Analyst webinar today. Uh, joining me this afternoon are Lee Lambert, our company founder and managing partner, and Dan Chaput, our director of professional services. Quick overview of today's session. Uh, Dan's going to start us off uh, by giving us a practitioner's view of the business rules management landscape, uh, including some changes that are driving uh, the need for new tools and approaches. Um, I'll then uh, go into detail about uh, one of those approaches, the Enterprise Rule Repository, talk about its place in a business rule management capability, and uh, discuss the ROI that this type of solution can drive. Uh, we'll then package up and summarize the, uh, the key points in the presentation and go into a question and answer session after that. So as Adrian mentioned earlier, uh, please uh, send us your questions as we go through the presentation, and uh, we'll look forward to answering those a little bit later on. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Dan Chaput to please uh, get us started. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. I would like to begin by discussing the various factors that drive complexity in the business process of business rules analysis. Before I begin, I have two brief items to set the context of my discussion. I'm assuming that each of you have an understanding of the business rules engine market as well as an understanding of the processes of gathering, documenting, and analyzing rules and decisions. You might refer to it as business rules approach, as decision modeling, as business rule analysis. No matter how you refer to it, I assume you recognize that the process is distinct from or possibly a discipline within other analysis and design processes in your organizations. The second context setting item is that my primary point of view that I'm preventing from today is that of a business rules analyst performing real work or as a manager of individuals performing this work. I've watched the business rules landscape evolve over the last decade. And my viewpoint has varied based on a variety of jobs and assignments. The rules engine projects products have matured, offering more tools for analysis and rules methodology. Individuals doing analysis have matured from simpler rule gatherers, and their business skills are being used more appropriately. The methodology efforts have moved into the scope of enterprise decisions. Business rules have earned, earned a place in the IT architecture. Throughout, the tools available to the business process analysts have really lagged behind. A few forward-thinking individuals have voiced a larger vision for these tools for many, many years. This vision has been stated clearly and repeatedly, yet there remains what I consider to be a significant gap between the typical business analyst or rules business analyst and the tools they have available to them and the execution of rules. Most business rules analysis and maintenance efforts go through some painful learning processes, starting small, most often succeeding fabulously, and then becoming mired in rules management. There are a number of lovely models that describe rule maturity and rule architecture and the enterprise, and as well as a number of methodologies about the approach. Today, I'm just going to take a very simple approach and ask the question, why was the job of rule analyst so much easier 10 years ago? Why do the difficulties persist and increase and what or who is making it harder. Let's look at what I see as the factors behind that complexity. My first complexity factor I'm going to call scope. 
all the earlier rules efforts, I and most of my coworkers were involved in were limited to a single project. The outcomes we were striving to reach were limited, the deployment clear. While we tried to get common enterprise level solutions on the horizon, we weren't getting paid to build an enterprise solution. We had a product to deliver and needed to stay on track. We did and succeeded using some rudimentary tools for our business rules analysis. Along the way, I personally discovered the world of business rule methodology, being that I came from an IT background. Today, the numerous rules projects across the enterprise, with numerous rules projects across the enterprise, organizations are looking to bring rules together in a single place to harmonize the rules across project and reduce rework. Our old analysis tools, spreadsheet-based solutions, and project-level applications have outlived their usefulness. Or worse, they've just become throwaway byproducts. A spreadsheet won't scale. Never mind the need for sharing, security, and audibility. My next complexity factor is approach. Early on, our solutions were more tactical in nature. We approached our problems with a fail-fast attitude. Again, the deliverables often ended up disposable, at best difficult to maintain. Today, the early adopters of rules are moving from disjointed tactical approaches to strategic solutions. Some of those who waited are actually getting to begin their rules projects as enterprise strategic level efforts. We must organize our rules in a rules repository for long-term value, allowing for more reuse of earlier work. We need accessibility. That said, we can't create a monolith within the enterprise. We can't create gatekeepers. And we need to allow, still, for a quick tactical project to play in our space. We need real agility. We've watched our focus change from just rules to a higher level of abstraction, the decision. Business process management often plays a key role, in some place, cases the leading role, in our organizations and on our assignments. As an analyst, this complexity can be offset by a tool that offers expandability and manageability. Last of my complexity factors is deployment. I was lucky early on to have to be working in an organization that actually deployed rules as services, very forward-looking. Today, I'm working on one rule service that's actually deployed across multiple enterprises. The rules are shared with individuals outside the firewalls and other applications and other organizations, but at the same time, it's not a black box app. The users need to understand and trust the system as it guides them in their work. They need the latest specifications, they need to know what's deployed, where those rules came from, who made the decisions to deploy the rules as they did. We waste a lot of valuable time importing, exporting, merging, distributing documents, trying to figure out if we have the right version. So let's just say that our, our complexity model is scope plus approach plus focus plus deployment. There are also a bunch of factors that can modify that complexity, some making it worse, some making it better. These groups are uh, a bit softer and a lot more fun to discuss. First one I'll touch on is timing. When the purchase of a shiny new rules engine is a given, the beginning of rules analysis is often delayed while an engine is selected. This does not have to be the case. Projects can start and save valuable time by using a tool and a methodology that is independent of the rule engine but could be adapted to any rule engine. Oh, by the way, when we're at the enterprise level, we may not yet have an enterprise methodology. Any tool would set off, would set these timing issues, needs to be independent of methodologies. Who's driving the project? Well, I really am an IT person working as a business analyst. I don't want to disparage IT people. But when IT tries to drive business rules projects, you get an IT project, not a business project. Joint open ownership and direction helps make the business analyst's voice heard. Having design tools that produce a professional product that IT can consume also reduces any business IT friction that might exist in your organization. This also factors in very 
very neatly with the factor above, timing, buy-in. This doesn't need to be said, but I had to put it in here. Having buy-in from the highest levels of the organization can make your job easier, or it can make an easy job very, very difficult. Silos. Sometimes we have to live with it, no matter how little sense it makes. It's probably beyond our control to do anything about the silos in the organization. As we go to the enterprise and we need to include our silo programs, how do we accommodate them? Silos can benefit from reusability also, but at the, si at the same time, the silos might need to maintain their autonomy. Another favorite of mine, similar to buy-in. No news to anyone, I'm sure, but there are organizations programs and individuals who play better together than others. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some auditability in the, in the product so we don't have to rehash the same discussions, so we, we could actually look at how collaboration was taking place within the organization? Wouldn't it be nice if the tool actually encouraged collaboration? If we could capture in a centralized place what collaboration was taking place and what issues we're having, right along with the design artifacts, it would be much easier to manage our, to manage our projects. So now I've really modified that complexity score to say it's scope plus approach plus, few, plus focus plus deployment modified by timing, drivers, buy-in, silos, and culture. Now for a picture a simpler approach. Rule of decision methodology is in the middle there. Uh, that's the world I really work in. I have my rule sources over on the left. Typically, you'll find that you get both getting code out of some sort of legacy system, some sort of written documents, and all of it being modified by subject matter experts in some cases, all the rules are actually in the subject matter experts' heads. Notice also I've got a feedback here across the bottom with some sort of results or performance metrics coming back from wherever, wherever rules are executed. Doesn't matter if it's the engine, doesn't matter if they're manual processes. They could be ni nicely organized metrics or they could just be ad hoc comments from users of the system. I apply whatever methodology I've chosen to use the rule sources, to do the rule capture, analysis, and design. Here it's that's represented just as a rules repository in Excel. Notice that in my example here, even though I've implemented a rules engine, I still have rules in other places. I might be managing rules that will always stay in the legacy code. I might be managing rules that are candidates to go into a rules engine, but are just in the process of being moved there, and I want to start managing them before they're really ready for the rules engine. The same holds true of manually executed rules that are executed in manual business processes. Impact analysis was simple. Management of the rules was simple. But within a single one-dimensional object like a rules repository that we built in Excel, it gradually becomes unmanageable. As our business focus changes, as we start to look at process models and decision models, and we start to look at this all as part of the enterprise, we start to see the gap widen. We respond to that by trying to beef up our simpler repository with term repositories, rule groupings, relationship mappings, endless numbers of things that we're doing in Excel. and uh, Often, often it becomes quite unmanageable quite quickly. So on a smaller project, I can often carry the rules around in my head. Once the project has grown to this complexity, this is no longer possible. Impact analysis, something that was very simple on a smaller project, now becomes extremely difficult and unmanageable. As the scope changes and moves towards the enterprise, as the approach becomes strategic, as the focus moves from rules to decisions and the architecture and deployment towards services, the tools fail to respond to increase in complexity. So I'm going to hand the presentation back to Rich now to present an alternative approach to the problem at hand. 
That's a great overview. Thanks, Dan. And frankly, a pretty, uh, pretty daunting picture that you've painted there. Um, when we look at that middle column and think about what it, what's in that column, it's all of our information about rules. It's traceability back to processes, sources, groupings by decision. It's all done in a bunch of spreadsheets with scotch tape and post-it notes. Um, and frequently, that center column is what drives our requirements. So um, if you feel comfortable with that, and, and many people don't, uh, what do you do to address it? And the answer increasingly is we've got to get off of spreadsheets, we've got to get off of paper, we've got to find something else. Um, and here comes the enterprise uh, business rule repository. So we're replacing that <coughs> very difficult to manage, very unwieldy, very one-dimensional to, to follow up Dan's point, um, system of tracking all of this information in these complex relationships, let's get them into one place that is more than one dimensional, and that's the, the rule repository. And let's get that, that link between our sources, our processes, our decisions, and downstream execution, regardless of where we're executing, whether it's a manual process, uh, an automated system that we've built homegrown, or uh, if we're exporting rules to a, a commercial, uh, commercial rules engine. So when we talk about rule repositories, first and foremost, we want this to be the single authoritative source about rules, terms, processes, decisions, all of the things that go into business logic uh, and how they're related, most importantly, because as the world gets more complicated and more complex and we're starting to talk about reusability of services, we really need to have a handle not only on what are the rules and where did they come from, but how are they related and how do they execute and what is the impact of changing uh, one rule, how does that impact the rest of the organization? So when we look at the, uh, the rule repository, we're really looking to do, at a high level, two things. Number one is provide structure and organization for all of the information that we just talked about, uh, getting all of the information about decisions, rule families, rule groupings, rule sets, and business terms into one place. Uh, and then also creating kind of a profile around those in that information. So. Uh, where does this information come from? Who controls it? Who is the subject matter expert that told us that this is the way things go on? Where does it execute? What process is it, is it aligned with? A lot of things to need to know simply between, beyond simply saying this is the rule and uh, these are the conditions, this is the conclusion. So having all of that in one place. After you've assembled all of that information and organized it in a consistent manner, then you can get to the second piece of the repository, which is all about analyzing and managing that information. So analysis can be anything from the bread and butter uh, rule analysis work that Dan's been doing in terms of looking at a set of rules to determine are they consistent, are they complete, are they accurate, are there overlaps, are there logical missteps that need to be addressed, um, all the way out to uh, what I would mentioned earlier, which is let me do some impact analysis. If I change this rule, what parts of the organization will be impacted? What decisions will be impacted? What's the second and third order decision that will be impacted? So that I know exactly what will happen, exactly what the impact of the change is going to be without uh, or minimal involvement of the law of unintended consequences. And those are the two things that we really want to do uh, with the rule repository and two things that frankly just at any, any level of scale and complexity aren't really feasible with a spreadsheet-based approach. We talked a lot about what a repository is and what it should do. Um, there's some attributes associated with an enterprise scalable, sustainable repository. Um, we've selected three that we think are critically important to any solution. Uh, the first one being it's got to support real-time collaboration. Uh, we're going to have multiple users accessing this information, viewing it, modifying it. We want them to be able to do that in real time. Um, and the reason we want to do that is that, uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, we can get into some serious uh, communication bottlenecks and process, uh, process delays. So if we go back to some of our earlier slides, we talked about spreadsheet-based repositories. And this is how things typically are done. Um, we're going to have one person on the project team. It's usually a junior person who's been assigned as the uh, 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 repository keeper or repository manager. So he's the keeper of the spreadsheet or she's the keeper of the spreadsheet. And uh, that person's now responsible for getting input from all manner of people about terms, uh, about rules, about sources, about how we do things in the field, um, from other business analysts, from subject matter experts. And as we look to kind of the right of this screen, it actually goes out several, several levels into the organization, all the way out potentially to management. Um, a lot of cross-conversations that go on, a lot of 
uh, discussions between people who may or may not be the right or most appropriate people to comment on what a rule is or what a term is defined as. Um, but nonetheless, these conversations go on, and eventually all arrows point to our repository manager who gets all of this information in emails or in spreadsheet updates or in post-it notes. Um, and they're tasked with consolidating all of that into, uh, into the repository. Now, why that's happening, while that consolidation practice uh, process is underway, um, everyone else is in the dark. They're waiting for the next version of that spreadsheet to come out to see if the changes that they've sent in were actually interpreted correctly and entered in properly, or do we have to go through another iteration. Um, a lot of time, to Dan's earlier point, gets spent on these conversations. Many iterations that really aren't necessary are undertaken simply because process and tools don't support uh, a more streamlined process. Uh, very frustrating times for the, uh, the rural repository manager. Um, and, and frankly, you know, we could probably put uh, you know, red exclamation points on everybody's head because you end up answering the same question. There's people out on the right are answering the same question three, four, five different times and, and still not getting the response back that they need. Uh, so first and foremost, um, enterprise business rural repository one source of information, always current, always up to date, may not always be accurate because it may be in flux and there may be people that need to talk things over, clarify, or, or validate. Uh, but at least we're all looking at the same page. We're all looking at it in real time so there aren't any processing or consolidation delays. Very important, huge streamliner. Second must-have attribute of any uh, enterprise class business, uh, business rule repository is accessibility for the entire organization. Um, you know, frequently what we see in a rules project is a situation where you might have 30 or 40 people, uh, rule analysts, business analysts, subject matter experts, programmers, uh, all coalesced around this project, all understanding exactly what's going into that spreadsheet and, and talking about what's going into that spreadsheet. And then it goes into requirements and then it kind of goes off into production. And if you go back to that same project uh, six months later, the 40 people that all knew exactly what was going into the product have lost touch. They've gone on to other things, and it's really down to two or three people that are maintaining the new system, whether it's a commercial business rules engine, whether it's a, a, a stick-built system or a homegrown built system, uh, that really know what's going on and how to get information about, uh, about the business logic again. So many times, sadly, what we see is that we've you know, harvested information from a legacy system, consolidated it, analyzed it, and then put it into a new system where it quickly gets lost again. So enterprise, we want to have a place where everybody can go outside of the system and know exactly what's going on and have that be the driver of changes in downstream execution. So again, the enterprise business rule repository approach um, actually has two benefits. We've got that, uh, as I said, uh, keeping everyone involved, improving the quality of information, the understanding of information, because everybody can go and get it and drill down to the level of detail that they need. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll see in a second, it also creates a very valuable uh, information asset. And this is one of the, the positive aspects of the law of unintended consequences. So typically what we'll see, we'll, you know, we'll have three classes, for lack of a better term, of users. We'll have uh, you know, one profile, which is really core users. These are business rule an analysts, system developers, rule engine people. These people, their jobs are to work with business rules in some form or fashion all day, every day. That's what they do. They go from project to project within an organization, but the focus is always rules. They're specialists. They're going to be closest to the uh, and, and most caring about the minute details of, of metadata within the repository. Second class of users is what we call the frequent user. And these are business analysts who may or may not specialize in rules, uh, or rules might be a small sliver of a project that they're working on subject matter experts who are very interested in rules but not necessarily interested in analyzing or, um, or writing rules, per se, um, but very interested in you know, validating that you know, what is being written is correct. So we want to make sure that they get in, uh, but they may not be writing rules. And then third, project management, who both at the project level are very interested in how things are progressing and what are my rule counts and which of my analysts are doing. Uh, the bulk of the writing and who's got the most rewrites coming through and the most rework coming through. And then also at a more strategic level, uh, looking at potential projects down the road and being able to go into this repository to get metrics. Uh, how long is this going to take us? How many rules will be impacted? How big a job is this really? Um, and a well-developed repository can provide them with that information. And then our third type of user is the, the casual or periodic user. And this is where that in, this idea of, a, of an information asset comes into play. Um, 
we've gone through multiple projects. We've documented a lot of information about uh, business rules and how they're connected to decisions and how the hierarchies and dependencies between rules, uh, what terms go into a particular rule. That's actually information that a lot of people who are on the business side are very, very interested in and frequently struggle to get. Uh, so if we take an example for, uh, of legal and compliance, um, you know, we're going to go out and audit our field, uh, our field sales activities. Well, the first question they have is, uh, what should I be auditing against? And that might be in a manual. It might be in some regulatory documents. Um, they might have to talk to the person who did the audit last year to just establish their baseline. Um, in this repository world that we're talking about, all of that information is accurate and up-to-date, and they can go to the repository, take a download, and know exactly what, they're, what they should be auditing against because what is in that repository, uh, properly managed, is exactly what's being executed or should be executed out in the field. And then finally, the last, uh, the last attribute of our, of our must-have three uh, for the repository is controls and governance. Uh, we're talking about having a lot of people uh, adding, modifying, changing data in real time. That can get out of control at an enterprise level, so everyone in the organization. Uh, so we obviously need to find, uh, find ways to, uh, to control the flow of information into the repository, or it's very quickly going to, uh, to get out of control. And you know, as we all know, repositories are only as valuable as the information and the quality of the information inside of it. So, you know, inf the information is questionable or frequently questioned. The repository really has no value no matter how deep it is. Uh, so we're very big and big proponents of control. A couple quick ideas on control. First of all, role-based permissions. Not everybody should be able to add information into the, uh, into the repository, and not everybody should be able to approve information that's come in there. It should be based on your role and, and position in the, uh, in the company and also your, your area of subject matter expertise. So if we're an insurance company and I'm an auto underwriter, then you know, maybe I'm approving rules on auto product, but I'm not looking at, uh, at homeowner's product. Second one is versioning and change management. Again, we're working in real time. We're not necessarily taking that step anymore of freezing the repository, making all of our changes, consolidating changes, and then sending it back out for validation. This is all happening in a much shorter loop, so the ability to, uh, to control and structure the information as it's being added in to avoid chaos is important. So we want to eliminate the confusion among users about what's current, which version, when did this change, who changed it. All needs to be tracked and easily accessible. Another one is review and approval processing. I alluded to this earlier with role-based permissions. Uh, we do need a process in place to make sure that the right people are looking at this information before it's published out to, uh, to the general population or that it's you know, changing it from a pending status to an approved status and, and in effect, making it law. Um, so setting up that workflow, automating it, making it easier for, uh, for the right people to be able to weigh in uh, is important. And then finally, audit trail and reporting. Um, you know, we talk about when did this happen, who did this, uh, why did this happen. Um, absolutely need to be able to go back and pinpoint exactly what happened, when it happened, uh, so that we can you know, validate or attest to the, uh, to the correctness of, uh, of what's inside the repository. So all of this is great. It sounds like a much better life, but as we all know, uh, we really can't do anything, especially now, unless there's a, an ROI behind it. So let's take a minute and look at that. Repository on day one is, is empty. Uh, so you know, there's very little ROI there. But what we see is that as we, uh, we come through projects, uh, we start to see benefit accrue. So on that first project, all about communication and processing uh, uh, efficiencies and getting things done faster. Um, our metric and our estimate, and it's been never been hotly contested, is that about 67 percent of any rule project's effort and time is built around rule discovery and rule analysis and getting the rules on paper, getting them right, and making sure that they're right. Um, the types of tools that we're talking about and the methodology changes that we're talking about by using this enterprise, enterprise repository approach can cut that in half. That, that equates to a 30% project savings, and that accrues over time. The second category of ROI is around reuse of uh, terms, rules, and decision structures. Once you populate the repository, it is now reusable. It can be reusable across the enterprise within a particular line of business or, uh, or a subsidiary. Um, but the bigger the 
repository gets, particularly if it's well managed, the more that's available for reuse and the less that we're you know, recreating from scratch. Um, we've seen many times where we've gone into a project uh, that was the second or third uh, phase of, a, of an initiative. Um, and there had been some you know, period of time, you know, a couple of months where things had lapsed, and we went to pick up the latest uh, spreadsheet, which contained all the rules and information, and it should have been a fast start, only to find out that, geez, you know, a lot of things changed in the last couple of weeks and months, and we have to, have to go back and essentially start from scratch. Um, so uh, you know, having a, a centralized place that we can go to on day one, knowing that it's up to date, promotes reuse, it promotes consistency, and um, as I said, as the as the repository scales, we can, uh, you know, we actually have more to draw from. Third uh, category of, uh, of benefit or return on investment is um, enabling is that information asset that we talked about uh, in a previous slide. Really making this this information available to people who may have nothing to do with rules or first order involvement with rules. So your legal and compliance people using it to help them in their everyday job uh, training. Uh, giving line management better information about what's, what is uh, being executed or what should be executed out in the field uh, so that they can do their jobs better. Um, and as I said, you know, there is a, uh, it's a cumulative and, you know, it tends to build on itself. So while it's not quite a parabolic curve uh, from first project all the way out to, uh, you know, to enterprise, uh, it, does, uh, it does accelerate. So we started this with uh, uh, two questions. What is an enterprise repository and, and do I need one? Uh, and we thought it might be a nice idea after, uh, after quite a few slides and a lot of ideas to kind of boil it down to one page. So uh, an enterprise repository is a single authoritative source of information about your business rules, your terms, your processes, your decisions, and perhaps most importantly and, and most notably for where we are, uh, the relationships and how they work together. And then the second question is, do I need an enterprise business rules repository? And our answer to that would be, you should consider one if any of the following are true. Uh, you're striving for greater consistency and reuse. Uh, you're starting to take a, a less project-based uh, and a more strategic enterprise-level approach to decision and business rule management. Uh, or if you're uh, engaged in or moving towards more of a, a service-oriented business architecture. So repository, or, uh, repository presentation on a page. We're actually going to start the question and answer session in just a minute, but uh, before we do that, Adrian, uh, we've worked with Adrian to create a quick uh, audience participation uh, section here where uh, we've got a two-question two poll for the audience, so we would ask you to, uh, to work with Adrian to, uh, to get answers in. We're very interested in your feedback. Okay, here's... Adrian, I'll hand it back to you to run that for us. Thank you, Rich. Here it is. Uh, here's the first question. The, uh, the first question is, uh, what are you currently using to document and manage business rules? Go ahead and cast your votes right now, and we'll give you a few seconds uh, to, uh, to answer and see who wins. Maybe you can make your own predictions. And then one second, and you guys are still answering it. So again, what are, your, what are you currently using to document and manage business rules, spreadsheets, or MS Word documents? Uh, access databases or some other on-grown solution, third-party software or none. I'm going to close this poll all the time. It looks like you guys voted. Let's see. Okay, a few more. There we go. Close the board and here are the results. So as you can see, most of you said that the majority of you, 63%, use spreadsheets and MS Word documents. So, Rich, I think that uh, kind of validates what you were saying earlier in the presentation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very consistent with what we see. And um, we've got a couple of people using databases and uh, a couple of people using third parties. So very consistent with what we see. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Let's try... Let's go to the next question. Uh, next one is, and this is multiple choice for you guys, which statements describe your organization's experience with business rules management? So go ahead and select um, all that apply. 
you can begin now multiple choice for you so the options are we're just getting started with business rules we have one or two business rule projects on the way we have adopted an enterprise-wide business rules approach we have used we use spreadsheets that meet our needs and last one we are in need of an enterprise business rules repository see about 60 percent of you voted give you a couple more minutes to complete excellent thank you here and let's take a look at the results and here we go about uh, 46 percent of you almost half of you are just uh, getting started with business rules and uh, the next big one is 34% uh, of you use spreadsheets that, that meet your needs. 32% uh, are in need of business rule repository, and 22% of you have uh, business uh, rule projects on the way. Again, this was multiple choice. Rich, it's back to you. Yeah, that's um, that's very interesting. It's uh, obviously consistent with our message, which is that uh, people are still transitioning to this, enter this idea of enterprise. Um, so it means that uh, from our perspective, we're, we're probably in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm a little surprised that uh, at the, the number of people that are just getting started or their organization is just getting started with business rules. Um, but. Um, could just be uh, something in the questioning, but uh, interesting stuff, and we certainly appreciate the uh, the input that we've received. Um, we're going to go ahead and take some questions now. Um, we've gotten uh, a pretty good number, actually, and we'll try and get through all of them in the next uh, 18 or 19 minutes. If you uh, if we do not get to your question, rest assured that we uh, we will be back to you via email with uh, with a response. So uh, do bear with us as we go through this. Um, one other um, quick housekeeping note as we're going through, we'll put up some uh, well, we'll just go ahead and go to the, uh, to the questions. So the first one, uh, I felt compelled to answer this one first. Um, does rule guide or the, uh, the enterprise business rule uh, repository eliminate the need for the repository manager? It does not eliminate your job. It changes your job significantly and makes, uh, makes your life um, better. So I didn't want anybody to be nervous about uh, ongoing employment based on the types of things that we're talking about. Um, but you know, instead of managing spreadsheets and consult, and this really applies not only to the manager but also the rural analyst, instead of spending time uh, and energy consolidating and massaging information and trying to get it into a usable format for analysis, we're actually kind of taking that, you know, that manual labor, that kind of low value, uh, you know, lower value, uh, you know, grunt work, for lack of a better term, and really making it easier for you to spend more time and, uh, you know, it's a better utilization of time and energy on the important, on the things that really matter. Uh, so, you know, rule analysis and really understanding what's going downstream in the execution layer. So it definitely does not eliminate the need or the job of the repository manager. It changes it and hopefully makes it a lot more interesting. Dan should put here, I've got the question, would it be right to say these methodologies are well suited for change management? Um, the, the rule management methodologies out there today are, are well suited for change management and work well. Um, rule guide is not a methodology but can be used with any methodology. What it is used for is to help you implement whatever methodology you're actually working with. So we have some methodology folks that we work with and we like them but we uh, strive to be independent of both methodologies on one side and rules engines on the other so that we're just an independent product. Thank you, Dan. Um, the next question that came in 
And I'm going to read this one uh, verbatim. Given that you propose the business rule efforts, that business rule efforts uh, be driven by the business, what level of detail do you propose in document, documenting and maintaining your business rules? Um, great question and really strikes at the heart of what we do. Um, you know, I talked a lot in here about you know, the importance of maintaining not just rules, but kind of creating profiles about rules. Um, so the high level answer to the question is we want to understand um, the sources of the rules, where did they come from, uh, which subject matter experts, uh, documents that they're, that they're linked to, uh, legacy systems that they might have been harvested out of. Uh, we want to know why the rules are executed. So what's the motivation? What's the strategic motivation? What's the tactical initiative that, you know, that this rule set is, is built around? Um, and we want to understand, you know, also, as I said, um, the processes where these rules are executed, the decisions that you know, these rules make up, uh, and the terms that utilize. So a lot of information about, um, about relationships. Now, on, you know, it's, you don't have to build the perfect repository on the first day. These are very evolutionary and they're designed to be flexible and, and evolve to where you're going. So, you know, we always counsel clients, don't necessarily focus so much on creating the perfect repository. Make the repository work for the work that you're doing and make sure that it meets those objectives. Um, so don't capture information that you don't need simply because, you know, you feel like you need to. Um, you know, capture the right level of detail, and it depends on the project, and, you know, we certainly work with people to, to determine what the right level of detail is for the current project and then down the road as well, and uh, maybe it is that we have to start tracking something early in the piece and perhaps uh, it's something that can wait to, uh, to we re reach another milestone. I have an interesting process question here. It's sort of not related uh, to rule guide, but it's, um, it's a methodology question, perhaps. It's our organization is cherry picking what to put in the repository. Does this happen to other organizations? It's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure what methodology you're using. I would imagine <clears throat> there's some sort of hierarchy for picking which rules are going to be going into the, uh, into the repository and that those rules would be either rules that were executed in extremely high volume, were of a, a very high value to the organization, uh, would mean its success and its failure, uh, or rules that are extremely volatile, that change a lot, and you need to understand the uh, impact of impact and do impact analysis as the rules change to understand if you're going to be breaking some other rule in changing that rule. So while I wouldn't necessarily call it cherry picking, I would say that there is prioritization rules. There rules typically are prioritized both to be analyzed, to be collected, to be used in a rules methodology, while there may be some that will very much take a back seat because they're a standard rule. It's been in the company for a long time. It's never going to change. It's very straightforward. It doesn't interact with other rules. Uh, so it might be a, a less likely candidate to uh, actually be uh, in, the, in the repository. The next question uh, that came across is, how does an enterprise business rule repository interact with a commercial business rule engine repository? Uh, great question. The short answer is that they're complementary. Um, the more detailed answer is that we are taking literally, you know, we're looking at rules regardless of where they execute. The, you know, the rule engine repository is a great source of information and management about the rules that actually fire within the engine. Um, but if there are things happening outside that engine, which is typically the case, um, you know, in other systems, manual processes, none of that's captured in there. So you get a very siloed view um, of the business rules, and you kind of lose that enterprise-wide connectivity and uh, big-picture view that is becoming increasingly important. So um, certainly uh, easy enough 
to you know, manage everything centrally in the enterprise repository and then export out to the commercial rules engine and update that one accordingly for the rules that, uh, they're, actually, that they're actually executing. The next question is, as an employee that is not a BA, is there a way to influence or encourage superiors to start looking more seriously at building an enterprise rules repository? Um, great question, and uh, one that we've actually, you know, we don't, uh, we don't always talk to um, the rule analyst or the, the business analyst community. We, we have uh, been brought in, particularly in industries where there's a lot of um, uh, Compliance-related issues, heavily regulated in, uh, industries such as the insurance industry, where um, really has uh, nothing to do with business rules per se, and just everything to do with the fact that we need a centralized place to document the way that we are supposed to be doing business in a very complex environment. Um, so, you know, it, in terms of actual tactics to have that discussion with, you know, with your management, I think you know, the first thing that you want to go out and look for is you know, within your, your own situation is, you know, uh, you know, what are our information needs? How are we currently meeting them? And if it involves, you know, doing research in multiple places and, and coming up with a result that still isn't uh, something that you have 100% confidence in um, and is perhaps disappointing because it is less than 100% confidence, you have less than 100% confidence and it's um, something that took a, a great deal of time and effort to put together. Um, those are the kinds of situations that, uh, you know, can be, you know, the conversation starter really is, gosh, we need a better way to manage this. Um, and as I said, in, in more regulated or more, uh, you know, rule-intensive type industries like financial services, um, you know, that those, those discussions are happening more and more. And that's, as I said, independent of any... Uh, you know, any discussion of a, a business rules management project or a decision management project, that's just... Uh, a Dan Chaput again. Uh, question, do you have any tips for integrating a new rules repository with an existing operations manual? We have some business policies that are in systems, some that aren't. I think I understand the question correctly. And what you want to do, again, is to make sure that you've got a repository that's independent of where the rule is actually being executed. I'm, I'm guessing we're talking about the execution end in terms of the policy. So there are some which you want to trace to a production system, to a line of code in a program, or to a, a method and an object model, perhaps and maybe some that are to manual policies that are just done as first-line workers in the field as a manual policy. So what you want is to make sure that you have a tool that gives you traceability both from the source of the rule all the way through to where that rule is executed. Next question is, um, oh, um, are there different permissions for accessing rules uh, between enterprise rules repository and the commercial uh, rules engine? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, what is in the repository is managed, uh, you know, based on role-based permissions in the repository. So whatever, you know, you've been cleared to see and do in the repository is what you can do. That may or may not be reflected in the rules engine uh, and, and what's happening, you know, what you're allowed to do there. So, you know, most of the commercial rule engines on the market right now have, um, you know, a web-based, uh, you know, what they call the business user interface. Uh, you know, Blaze Advisor, for example, calls it the, uh, the rules maintenance application or RMA, but that's where you go in and, and you can make changes to rules. That is managed, uh, you know, that are going out to deployment. That's managed completely separately. Um, obviously, in a perfect world, there'd be a, uh, you know, an airtight uh, connection between the two. Uh, and in most cases, you know, it's properly managed on both sides, um, so it doesn't become an issue. But the, even the nature of some of the activities that you would undertake in one versus the other would, you know, would require that uh, you, know, you might have slightly different permission levels in each.
Uh, we have we have one comment here that says thank you, and we responded you're welcome. But uh, you're welcome to anyone else who has got the comments. Thank you. Um, Um, there's a question, how do we support metadata? Uh, that's a very difficult question because it's a sort of a meta question. And I've worked in different organizations which define metadata differently. So let me, very differently. So let me use, and I'm, you know, I, I do have a bias towards which one I think was right and which one I think was wrong, but let me briefly describe that. Um, Rule guide will allow for any number of attributes to be, uh, or rules to be grouped together by any sort of user-defined uh, value that you want. I mean, there, there are a number, uh, that's, uh, that's sort of a vague answer, but metadata is data about data. And there are ways to extend the product so that you can describe your rules and create your own and I, I types, I understand people have used the word rule type. You know, I'm using the word type as just meaning a group of things together. So there, there, are, there are ways to do that. And it's just the, I mean, behind the product, it's all relational database. So they're just really simple relationships of metadata to rules. The other type of metadata, and I'm saying sort of putting this in quotes, is when folks have groups of rules that, or, that are organized and execute slightly differently, for example, in different jurisdictions. So you might have standard rules, sort of a standard rule shell, but in one state it will have one particular set of parameters. In another state it will have another particular set of parameters. And again, that's very similar in that it's a relational database and you're capable of describing them all by just adding yet another permutation of how the word, how the rule actually is executed in a particular place. I, I hope I answered your question. That's a, again, as I said, that's a, a wonderful question, but I, it almost needs me to chat with whoever the user is. So do we have another question coming up here? Well, since we're getting near the end, interestingly, yes, we've gotten a couple questions, John. Um, do you know of any commercially available rule repositories on the market? So uh, first of all, I would like to welcome my mom for, and thank her for attending. And um, yeah, we obviously have uh, uh, the Rule Guide Enterprise Repository, which uh, you know, we're very confident you know, addresses a lot of the issues that we've discussed. And this is probably a good time for us to just let you know about how to you know, get more information. Uh, you can visit us on the web, as you can see. Um, you can contact myself for a uh, consultation. You know, we can talk about some of the questions uh, that you might have and uh, even you know, fire up the product and give you a demonstration. Um, and we're also going to be appearing at a couple of conferences next week. So for those of you who are attending the, uh, the Business Rules Forum in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, Lee Lambert will be presenting with one of our clients out there. Uh, so stop by, see him, or if you're going to be in New York for the BPMI Institute's uh, brainstorm session in, in the big city, um, please stop by and see me. I'll be talking about rule uh, repositories there. And so with that, I think we're at just about at the top of the hour. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Adrian. Thank you all very much for attending, and we look forward to uh, hearing and speaking with you. Yes, uh, thank you again for everybody for attending this Modern Analyst webinar, and many thanks to Rich, Dan, and Lee for a very informative presentation. I wanted to point out that a webinar along with the slides will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. So you can always uh, listen again to the information and download the slides from there. This concludes today's event and thank you again and we hope you have a great day.